In this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of African American culture within the United States. Um, we left off last time, we talked about the Dred Scott Supreme Court decision and how that basically pushed the United States over the edge into Civil War. We also talked about some statistics about the Civil War. Well, once the Civil War was completed and the Union was successful, that didn't magically make everything okay. The tensions that had still been there between the North and the South still existed. So the question was, what is to be done after the Civil War? And this is a time period that we call Reconstruction. Interesting enough, President Lincoln never actually considered the southern states as separate or seceded from the Union. He always saw them as being a part of the Union and did not accept that they could leave. However, what happens on April 14, 1865 is Lincoln was assassinated in Ford's Theater and Vice President Andrew Johnson becomes president. So what happens after the Civil War is that you have to remember this deep-seated way of life had been ingrained in the South. So a signed piece of paper, a surrender, does not make everything okay. And now you additionally have 3.5 million freed slaves. Think about this. You're suddenly a free slave. Do you own anything? Do you have anywhere to go? Do you have any possessions? No. So what happens to these individuals? How do we take care of them? Well, Reconstruction basically became a struggle to find the meaning of the war and the meaning of freedom. Many Southern blacks and whites often disagreed what this meant. And what happened is that you had a lot of the newly freed slaves who pulled away from the white society and began to establish their own schools, churches, clubs, and societies. For many whites, this meant trying to reestablish the antebellum ways and solidify white supremacy. Again, April 14, 1865, Lincoln is assassinated and Vice President Andrew Johnson becomes president. During this time in the 1865s, um, 1865 and 1866, we're going to see what's called as black codes, which would start to happen, and what, or start to be passed. And what this, these were was usually in the southern states, what would happen is the southern states would pass these codes or laws, and they were an attempt to basically take the newly freed slaves and put them back into the situation they had been previously. For example, here's an example of one of these codes. An unemployed colored person could be apprehended for vagrancy and fined. Well, many of these people, this would have been uh, colored men, were trying to find work. Yet if they were loitering somewhere, they would often be arrested, and then they would be charged a fine. Well, they had no income, so they had no money. Then what would happen is they would be hired out to pay for these fines. Um, for example, do you know where they'd be hired out to? To the very plantations they would work. And so they'd be forced to work on these farms until their fine was paid off. Other examples of black codes was that it, for, it forbade blacks from owning or leasing farms. It forbade them from taking jobs other than as plantation workers or as domestic servants basically trying to make it so the only jobs they could work in the South were the exact same positions they were forced to work while in slavery. However, Congress did respond to this in April of 1866 by passing the first Civil Rights Act. This declared that blacks were citizens and gave the federal government the power to intervene in state affairs to protect the rights of citizens. Eventually, this led to the 14th Amendment, which was ratified July 9, 1868, and this defines citizenship under the Constitution. And the 14th Amendment reads, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state within they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall any state government deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. And that's just from section one of the amendment. So what this does, basically it says there could be no other requirement for citizenship. 
In other words, states could not pass citizenship requirements um, such as tests or any lengthy amount of time you had to live there as a freed person. Um, also at this time, what they wanted was that any state that has seceded that ratified the 14th Amendment could be readmitted to the Union. Remember, Lincoln never saw the states as leaving. Johnson and Congress did, so they had to be reaccepted into the Union. Only Tennessee ratified the 14th Amendment. So what happens with this then is the remaining Confederate states were actually seen as military districts. To be readmitted, was that you had all qualified voters, both black and white, must register, and then they could elect conventions to prepare new state constitutions. These conventions, these constitutions, had to include black suffrage, meaning the right for African American men to vote. Then you could elect new state governments. Congress then had to approve the new state constitution, and the states had to ratify the 14th Amendment. When enough states did it to make it a part of the Constitution, meaning three-fourths of the United States, all the former Confederate states could be restored to the Union. So what happens? The 14th Amendment became part of the Constitution in 1868, and by this time, all the states had rejoined but Virginia and Texas, who both rejoined in 1869, and Mississippi, who rejoined in 1870. Then we have the passage of the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment forbade all states and federal government to deny suffrage, again, the right to vote, to any citizen on account of race, color, or previous condition of ser servitude. And this was ratified in 1870. So what happens? This gave free black men the right to vote. Women were still left out of this. And what happens from this is it was successful. Freed black men did become politically active. Most Republicans in the South were freed black men. And from 1869 to 1901, 20 served in the U.S. House of Representatives and two in the Senate. Also, several served in various state and level, state level government. However, the percentage of colored office holders was far lower than the percentage of the black population, meaning we did not have adequate representation. What happens next? General Ulysses S. Grant was elected president in, six, in 1868. He had absolutely no political experience, and his presidency was known for being full of scandal. However, he was reelected in 1872. Um, in 1867, the United States purchased Alaska from Russia for $7.2 million. In 1872, we began to see the rise of a secret society that used intimidation and violence to influence black voters. This was the beginning of the Ku Klux Klan. Then we have Congress passes the Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871. This was to have help the federal government fight against the prejudice that's going on. And what these acts did was they gave the national government the authority to prosecute criminals by uh, cr prosecute crimes by individuals interfering with a person's right to vote under the federal law. And it also authorized the president to use federal troops to protect civil rights. Ruther B. Hayes is elected president 1877 to 1881. James A. Garfield was elected president March 1888 to September 1880. I'm sorry, March of 1881 to September of 1881. He was assassinated. And then we had Chester A. Arthur, who took over the presidency from 1881 to 1885. Well, this leads us to what's known as the civil rights cases. These were argued March 29, 1883, and were decided October 15, 1883, of a vote of 8 to 1. And what was at issue here was the nature and extent of Congress's power to enforce the Civil Rights Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. Well, what happened is that they decided, the Supreme Court decided that Congress could only act in state actions, not private actions, including those for public accommodations. Meaning, say we have a bus, um, I own a bus, and I own it by myself individually, and I decide that only certain races can be on it. 
Well, under the holding of these cases, that was absolutely fine. Now, if the state of Kentucky owned a bus line and they said they would only cater to races, that was not allowed because that was state action. Basically, what happens with the civil rights cases was it declared parts of the Civil Rights Act of 1875 unconditional that prohibited racial discrimination in inns, public conveyances, and places of public amusement. Clearly, it showed there were still two views on how the Civil War Amendment should be interpreted. You have the conservative narrow view that saw the 13th Amendment as abolishing slavery and nothing else. And the 14th Amendment granted free people citizenship and offered a measure of relief from state discrimination. However, the opposite view, the broader, broader or radical view, believe the amendments were there to help secure to the free people and others all rights of free people in Anglo-American legal culture and give the national government authority to protect citizens against both state and private deprivations of these rights. However, what happens is that the majority view, which was the more conservative view, claimed that this would make the freed persons, quote, the special favorite of the laws, and therefore is saying they would get special treatment. The one dissenting judge was Justice John Harlan Sr. He was a Southerner and a former slaveholder. However, he saw that slavery was rooted in the principles of racial inferiority, and he claimed that these cases continued this. He said the difference between state and private action did not exist when the accommodations were intended for public purposes. Again, the example, if you own your own bus and you use it only for your own personal use and you don't want to admit people of a certain race, that's fine. That's your prerogative. But when you own your own bus and then you sell seats to the public to ride on this bus, but then you will not allow people of a certain race on your bus, that should be the same. He says that's discrimination. However, he's in the dissent. The civil rights cases said no. If it was the state doing it, it's a problem. But when it's a private person doing it, even when they hold it out for public conveyance, it's still not the same. However, Harlan maintained that when rights were impaired by racial discrimination, regardless of the source of the violation, the action, quote, lay at the very foundations of the institution of slavery. However, the cases held the 14th Amendment prohibited state governments from discriminating based on race, but did not restrict private organizations or individuals from doing so. Basically, this largely mandated the withdrawal of federal, federal government from civil rights enforcement. These cases laid the groundwork for society based on official segregation. And because of this, we're going to see a rise of what's known as the Jim Crow laws. These were laws passed by Southern lawma lawmakers that enforced racial segregation. Grover Cleveland then becomes president from 1885 to 1889. He was also president in 1893 to 1897. He's the only president to serve non-consecutive terms, and he's considered both the 22nd and the 24th president. Um, Benjamin Harrison is president from 1889 to 1893. And then this is going to bring us up to our next Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson. This was argued April 13, 1896, and was decided May 18, 1896, of a vote of 7 to 1. You'll note it's 7 to 1 here. Justice Brewer did not participate because he had actually been absent from the hearing, so he did not, um, he did not think he should make a, a ruling on the decision. Well, what happens in Plessy versus Ferguson is basically it validated state legislation that institutionalized the separation of the races. It upheld a Louisiana law that required segregation seating on state railroad cars. Now, this could not apply to interstate commerce, meaning going between states. Why? Because when you travel from state to state, it's actually covered by federal law by the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, and you could not discriminate under federal law. However, Plessy versus Ferguson is looking at state law. 
Plessy versus Ferguson is most well known because it established the doctrine of separate but equal. So here's the background of the case as is explained in your textbook. This is an example of what's called interest group litigation, meaning it was a case that was purposely set up with the intention of taking it to the courts to defend or expand people's rights. It was a test case that was brought by the Citizens Committee to test the constitutionality of the separate car law. This was not the NAACP. The NAACP was actually not founded until 1909. But what happens is that um, we have this test case. So we have Plessy. He actually volunteered to be the test case. Plessy was an individual. He actually looked pretty white, and he, but he was only one-eighth colored. So he was considered, quote, colored under the Louisiana Code. And that's where you're going to hear this shift. Last time, we would say slaves or blacks a lot. Now the terminology switches to colored. Because with separate but equal, basically it's anybody white or not white. So you would see white and colored. And there was the one drop rule, meaning that if you had one single drop of colored blood within you, you were considered colored and therefore not white. So what happens, Plessy actually looks like a Caucasian, but he's legally colored under the Louisiana Code. Interestingly enough, both the railroad and the conductor knew of his colored status. Also interesting, the railroads did not like these laws that stated that there were separate cars for the races because then the railroads were required to provide separate cars and it cost them more money. So what happens? Plessy goes and he buys a ticket. He buys a first class ticket um, on June 7th, 1892 for a 50 mile trip completely in Louisiana. Remember, it's important that it's completely in Louisiana. If you cross state lines, this would be regulated under the federal law, but it was not. It was only in Louisiana. He was asked to move to the colored section. He refused, and he was arrested, as was planned. The goal was to challenge an 1890 state law that required, quote, that no person or persons shall be permitted to occupy seats in coaches other than the ones assigned to them on account of the race they belong to, unquote. The law required separate but equal facilities for the different races, but it did not define race. What happens then? The nation's leading civil rights lawyer, Albon W. Turgey, had already been employed to handle the court battle before Plessy was ever arrested. Plessy claimed the statute was unconstitutional under both the 13th and the 14th Amendment. In July 19, 1892, Plessy was formally charged with violating the Jim Crow laws and appeared before Judge John H. Ferguson in criminal court of New Orleans. This is a state court. Plessy asked Ferguson to dismiss the charges because the state law violated the 13th and 14th Amendment and imposed a badge of servitude on Plessy and deprived him of the privileges and immunities of citizenship. The Louisiana State Court rejected his argument on November 18, 1892, citing the Slaughterhouse case of 1873 and the Civil Rights cases of 1883, claiming the law was a reasonable use of the state's police power to protect the public health, safety, welfare, and morals. Yet it never defined who this public was and what they were in danger of by Plessy riding in the other car. Turgey then sought review by the Louisiana Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court upheld Judge Ferguson's decision on January 2, 1893. Then they applied to be heard by the United States Supreme Court. The document arrived in Washington, D.C. before the end of February. However, it sat waiting in the Supreme Court for three years, and Turgey, Plessy's lawyer, didn't try to expedite the case. Why? Because he knew the sitting justices, and he did not think they would side with Plessy, so they waited, hoping something would happen and there would be new justices. However, there were no changes when the case actually came to be heard on April 13, 1896. Interestingly, because I believe of a fire, no record or accounts have actually survived. Most of the information we have from this case are from the lawyer's records.
So what happens before the Supreme Court? On May 18, 1896, the court held the 13th Amendment was only meant to apply when the action was meant to reintroduce slavery itself. The decision limited the 13th Amendment to consider slavery as actual, quote, bondage, the ownership of mankind as chattel, or at least the control of the labor and services of one man for the benefit of another, unquote. It also claimed the 13th Amendment only extended to slavery and nothing more. The claim that the law imposed a badge of servitude was too clear for argument, and they dismissed it. Also, the decision limited the 14th Amendment. The court acknowledged the purpose was to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law, but they held the amendment did not, quote, intend to abolish distinctions based upon color or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or commingling of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory to either, unquote. They stated that racial harmony cannot be achieved by laws which conflict with the general sentiment of the community upon which they are designed to operate. Basically, the court said this was a social matter and not a political matter and that they cannot force the two groups to get along. They cannot force them to co-mingle. And this case says there's a difference between discrimination and a distinction. And this case was simply a distinction. And they went on to say official segregation did not imply that one group was inferior to the other. Justice Henry B. Brown wrote for the majority and held, quote, The Jim Crow law did not discriminate on racial grounds. It simply recognized a distinction between the races which must always exist, so long as white men are distinguished from the other races by color. End quote. Brown claimed the states had implied police powers to protect the public's health, safety, welfare, and morals, and laws based on these power need only demonstrate a reasonable basis to pass judicial scrutiny. Basically, he's stating that in purpose to protect one group, it's better to keep the groups separate. And by distinguishing by the distinction of race was enough to do this. However, he did not state which police power the state law further, and he did not define what was meant by reasonable. Judicial review that favored racial commingling, he said, would be unwise and futile. And state lawmakers were at a liberty to act with reference to the established usage, customs, and traditions of the people, and with a view to the promotion of their comfort and the preservation of the public peace and good order. And of course, we know what race he is talking about here. Were they concerned about making things comfortable for the colored race? No. These, this law was firmly put in place to keep the white race from happening to commingle, as their term was, with the colored races. So what happens with Plessy versus Ferguson? It established racial segregation that became the cornerstone of white supremacy. If one race be inferior to the other socially, the Constitution of the United States cannot put them upon the same plane. It's another quote from the decision. He continued to claim that a separation places a badge of inferiority on the colored race. He said, If this be so, it is not by reason of any that thing found in the act, but solely because the colored race chooses to put that construction upon it. Basically, he's saying, it's not our problem, it's your problem. You see the separation as a bad thing. We just view it as keeping the two races from happening to co-mingle. So think about this. Think about if you're sitting in a classroom and you have to move to the front of the class, sit in the desk and face everybody else. You have the same materials, you hear the same lectures, you can take your notes, you can ask your questions, but you're forced to sit somewhere else. Would this make you feel different? Probably, but according to the court in this case, well, that's on you. That's a social distinction, not a political one, and it's on you for feeling that difference.
So what happens next? Harlan dissents again. He used a broader view of the term civil rights to include protection from discrimination in all places subject to state regulation. He asserted, quote, the destinies of the two races in this country are indissolubly linked together, and the interests of both require that the common government of all shall not permit the seeds of race hate to be planted under the sanction of the law. He claimed the Civil War amendments were meant to prohibit states from discriminating against blacks in their enjoyment of civil rights that all citizens held. He went on to say, quote, there is in the country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. Meaning, in respect to civil rights, protection from discrimination in all places that were subject to state discrimination. And then he went on further to compare this decision to the Dred Scott case, asserting there is no separate and equal. And he says the law is intended to keep blacks from white cars and not whites from black cars. And so that's where we get with this case. It institutionalizes the idea. It establishes the doctrine of separate but equal, which was taken to, we're going to see, to further and further extremes. So what happened to Plessy? Well, January 11th, 1897, Plessy entered a guilty plea in the criminal district court. He paid a fine of $25. We really don't know much about him. He gave no interviews and he made no statements. And then he died in 1925 at the age of 63. However, his name will always be linked with this case, which has established the doctrine of separate but equal. So now we're going to move from 1896 with this decision. Basically, it laid the groundworks for an entire society built upon Jim Crow laws. These were laws that enforced racial segregation in the United States South between the 1800s and 1950s. The term was actually taken from a minstrel show routine, and it became a derogatory epitaph for African Americans. After Reconstruction, Southern legislators passed more and more laws requiring segregations of whites and, quote, persons of color on public transportation. These, because of the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, later extended to schools, restaurants, and other public places. And it wasn't until the Supreme Court case of 1954 that this de these decisions were actually overturned. So let's look at Brown versus the Board of Education. This was argued December 9th, 1952, and re-argued December 8th, 1953. It was decided May 17th, 1954, and it was the decision of 9 to 0, and Chief Justice Earl Warren wrote for the court. At issue here was whether official segregation of schools on the basis of race, violated the 14th Amendment. Under the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, this was constitutional. However, the Brown versus Board of Education case challenges that. So, as we have here now, the background again, as established by Plessy, official segregation was, quote, in the nature of things and an appropriate means of ensuring public comfort, tradition, and order. Well, what happens at this time is the NAACP initiates legislation designed to achieve full equalization of facilities, curriculum, and faculty in black and white schools. Basically, its main obstacle was the Plessy decision. And what was wanted is they wanted to unveil the true nature of the separate but equal doctrine. Well, interestingly enough, who argued the case for the NAACP? Your textbook talks about this. First, he argued the Briggs case, and then when it was combined, um, it was part of the combined five cases. This is Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall later becomes the first African-American appointed to the Supreme Court in 1967. Um, well, what had happened in some of these earlier cases, there had been some success that 
um, people would, schools would sue, people would sue the schools based on how unequal there was between the white schools and the colored schools. So what happens based on this success? Some southern schools began to put more money into the colored schools, but the courts held this enough was not, this alone was not enough. The Brown case addressed segregated public schools in Delaware, Kansas, South Carolina, and Virginia. However, the Brown case arose in Topeka, Kansas. This case, we know it as the Brown versus the Board of Education case. However, alphabetically, Briggs should come first, but it's known as the Brown case. And this was a combination of five different cases that were put together. So who was Brown? Well, this was Oliver Brown, and he believed his daughter should be able to attend the school that was closest to her home. It was a white school. Oliver Brown was colored under the law. And when he wanted to take his daughter to the white school, the school authorities refused to admit her, so he sued. Well, what's most important to this case is the new Chief Justice Earl Warren brought with him a desire to re-examine the separate but equal doctrine in all contexts. The case was heard in 1952, the court invited re-arguments in 1953, and then finally announced its decision in 1954 and provided relief in 1955. Basically, the court asked what the framers of the 14th Amendment intended, and they decided that the school system had radically changed since that time and that the framers and ratifiers' intent was, quote, not sufficiently clear. So what happens? The court stated they would not turn the clock back to 1868 when the amendment was adopted or even to 1869 when Plessy v. Ferguson was written. The court stressed the importance of opportunity in education, that it plays a critical role in determining the personal opportunity and development of the students. So then it asked if racial segregation affected educational quality. And what they found, based on psychological findings, the court held that racial segregation of school children, quote, creates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone, unquote. And here's an example of this that your book talks about. This is what's called the Doll Studies. May 24th, 1951, um, Kenneth B. Clark conducted in Clarendon County, South Carolina, an experiment. And what he did um, in Clarendon County, South Carolina, there were about 32,000 residents. More than 70% of them are African American. And so what he did is he took 16 colored children between the ages of 6 and 9, and he showed them four dolls. Two of the dolls were boys, two were girls. They were dressed exactly the same, except two were pink and two were brown. And then he asked the children different questions, such as, which doll do you want to play with? Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll looks bad? Which doll is the nicer color? 10 picked the white doll to play with, 11 said the brown doll looked bad, and 9 picked the white doll as the nice one. From decisions of th like this, I'm sorry, from Studies like this, the court held that separate but equal has no place in public education and that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal and therefore they violated the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. And on page 386 of your book, you can see the quote where they state, What brought Kenneth Clark from New York? To, from New York to Scotts Branch, Thurgood Marshall had decided to use the Briggs case to attack school segregation at its roots. What made the enforced separation of black children from whites most damaging, he felt, was not tattered books or untrained teachers, but the stigma of inferiority that segregation inflicted on black children. School officials could buy newer books and hire better teacher for black children, but they could not erase feelings of inferiority from their mind. Basically, this is saying the schools could be absolutely perfectly e equal, which we know they were not. But this says it doesn't matter even if they were equal. The problem is the separate, and that when you separate school children from each other, 
you're telling them they're separate for a reason. And therefore, there can be no separate and equal. On 388, your text continues. Clark outlined his prior research on the self-images of black children. The cumulative effects of discrimination, prejudice, and segregation have definitely detrimental effects on the personality development of the Negro child, Clark stated. The essence of this detrimental effect is a confusion in the child's concept of his own self-esteem. Basic feelings of inferiority, conflict, confusion, and his self-image, resentment, hostility towards himself, hostility towards whites. And so what they're saying in this is that separation, segregation, is per se inequality. And the court agreed with them. Chief Justice Warren stated he wrote the opinion without legalese so it could be understood by laymen and he even wanted it reprinted widely in the public press. Also, he wanted a unanimous court. Remember in the past cases, seven to one, eight to one. He wanted a unanimous court. Why? Because he wanted to show a unified court. They left it until the next term. How to enforce this decision in the Brown versus Board of Education 2. What ends up happening in Brown versus Board of Education 1, again, the court 9 to 0 overturns the Plessy decision and said separate but equal is segregation. Segregation is per se inequality and therefore it is unconstitutional. However, how this was to be enforced, they were told the states that they were required to make a prompt and reasonable start towards full compliance, yet they never said how to do this, and the court required affected schools to desegregate, quote, with all deliberate speed, end quote, but it set no timetable. So what happens? You have the southern states being told that you can no longer, well, all the states being told that you can no longer have segregated schools. Many southern states resisted. You had widespread, right, widespread resistance, evasion, and delay. Some states completely ignored it. In fact, Arkansas passed a law stating the court's ruling was unconstitutional. Over 100 southern members of Congress signed in 1956 a manifesto denouncing the Brown decision and urged their constituents to defy it. By fall of 1957, only 684 of the 3,000 schools affected by this decision had even begun to desegregate. And it would take further effort by the court and eventually Congress to fully desegregate the schools. However, the court continued to spread this desegregation principle to all public corners of society, including benches, beaches, parks, public transportation, and other settings. The court effectively overruled the Plessy decision. In September of 1957, the federal courts had ordered the desegregation of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. An angry white mob formed a blockade, and the governor refused to do anything to stop the mob. So how was the court able to enforce the decision? They didn't, but the president did. President Eisenhower, faced with direct state defiance of the federal authority, ordered federal troops to Little Rock to keep the peace and ensure the court's desegregation orders were obeyed. And this decision helped spark, spark what is known as the modern civil rights movement, including the Civil Rights Act of, of 1964. By 1970, almost half of all black children in the South attended predominantly white schools, a higher percentage of desegregation that existed even in the North. So in one level, the Brown versus Board of Education decision was very successful. However, again, it did not make things magically okay. And that's what I'm going to have you look at in the last two things for this chapter or this section. Here what I have, this is the blue-eyed and brown-eyed experiment. Jane Elliott was a teacher in Iowa, and basically she taught in an elementary school third graders. And when Martin Luther King was assassinated, some of her children in her classroom, it was all little white children, 
um, were talking about this. And she needed, she felt she needed to get them to understand discrimination and what it felt like to be discriminated against for something that you could not change. And so that's where I'd like you to watch the first of the YouTube clips. And this is talking about the actual experiment that she would conduct with her classes. And this was the blue-eyed and the brown-eyed experiment. So please watch this. Then the second clip is actually from an Oprah Winfrey show where they revisited these same children 20-some years later. And I want you to pay attention with how quickly um, segregation or discrimination is taught to these young children. And then the last thing you're going to do for this section is you're going to watch the film Four Little Girls. This is a documentary directed by Spike Lee. It was put out in 1997 and it's about the bombing of the 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And within this film, right, this happens in 1963. This is after Brown versus the Board of Education, nine years. However, this film shows that in many places, you know, things did not magically just go okay. And I want you to pay attention within this film of the racial tensions that are still there. Um, I will warn you that some of this is, you'll see somewhat graphic images. However, it's nothing overly grotesque. Um, but please pay attention to that. You'll be asked to comment on both the brown-eyed and blue-eyed experiment and Four Little Girls. Four Little Girls, I have set up a different link to the video. The full video is available to you on YouTube. If you have any questions, please let me know.